My name is Indra Øvland and I work here at NUPI and it is my pleasure to open this event. Uh, we have three speakers today. Um, Knut Østby, who is the uh, resident representative and humanitarian coordinator and various other roles for UNDP in Myanmar. Uh, and I think, uh, well, as you can see, he's, he's Norwegian and I guess that's, that's the... Uh, if you hadn't been Norwegian, I'm sure we would be lucky to have somebody like you to be able to attract you to come here and, and speak. Uh, so we're very glad to have you here. <clears throat> and uh, the other two speakers are uh, Christian Stokke, who is a professor at the University of Oslo, uh, and um, Roman Vakulchuk, who is a senior research fellow at NUPI. And they are, uh, along with myself, uh, authors of uh, a country study or political economy analysis of Myanmar, which we published very recently, and which is part of a series of such studies which NUPI has organized of uh, 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 Norway's main develop, uh, development aid uh, corporation partner countries. Um, <clears throat> we will have three quite short presentations, and then we will open the floor to comments and questions and discussion afterwards. So if you have anything you would like to say, it's great, and please remember what it is until the discussion. <clears throat> um, the event will be streamed to uh, Nupi's television channel on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> I think with that I will uh, open the floor and invite Christian to give the first presentation. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, this is quite a big job that we have done. It's a truism that uh, in Myanmar, things are complex. This is an effort to try to create a little bit of pattern and order in complexity without doing too much injustice to the complexity. It is also becoming a truism that uh, in order to do something meaningful in Myanmar, you need to understand contextual politics. And this report, at least the part of the report that I have been involved in, uh, is also an attempt to try to unpack a little bit of that contextual politics. In it complexity, but also make sense of that complexity. So it is a task that we found quite challenging, but also very stimulating, and I think it is important. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few points. I'm not going to try to summarize the re whole report. As we say at the university, do the reading. Um, but I'm going to highlight a, a couple of points. The first one I, that I want to make is simply that the, about the importance of understanding the military. If you're going to understand or understand the role of the military. And uh, we start the report by having a discussion about the nature of the state. And the foremost point that we make there is about the military state capture. That uh, this is a country where you, if you want to talk about state autonomy, the first and foremost political and economic force in society that you need to keep in mind is the military. The military is the state security apparatus, but it is also in a, a semi-autonomous uh, economic and political force that have over the years captured the state. And that defines so many things about the state. The authority of the state, but also the contested authority of the state by a number of ethnic organizations especially. Uh, the capacity of the state and the legitimacy of the state. So that's an absolute essential knowledge, I think. The second thing is about this transition. The second point that I want to make is about the nature of the transition or the democratic opening or a transition from authoritarianism. The way we describe it is itself a little bit complex and contested. But there's no doubt that there have been some kind of an opening in economics, in politics, and in regard to intrastate conflicts. Some of it started as far back as in the 90s, 
some of it is first and foremost something that has happened after the change of government in 2011. So then, and this is an idea that I learned from, have learned from my PhD candidate, So Min Tang, who's at the back of the room, about the importance of thinking through what kind of transition is this? And how does our understanding of the mode of transition also influence the understanding of the outcomes? Now, this is a straightforward table from political science, democracy studies about, what, um, about modes of transition. And the debate in Myanmar has first and foremost been about whether we should understand it as a pacted, elite, multilateral, negotiated transition, or if we should see, if we should see it as a unilaterally imposed transition, driven first and foremost by the military. In the report, we, su we sum up the first perspective a little bit like this. So this is a story about um, softliners within the military uh, trying to reform and being somewhat enlightened military leaders, seeing the need for a democratic opening. And see, uh, finding an alliance, first and foremost with the civil society bloc known as the Third Force, and its international sponsors, and seeking to move political parties, uh, ethnic armed organizations, and civil society organizations, both within and in exile, from what was seen as a hardline anti-military position towards some kind of accommodating softline position. And the principal means and the test was the willingness to engage in parliamentary politics under the 2008 constitution. <clears throat> the second understanding is up in that other corner, that this is an, seen as an imposed transition. It is the military that has driven it. It is a military that is relatively coherent, not divided. It is a process that has not seen much negotiations or pacts. And it is first and foremost institutionalized or constitutionalized in the military's own designed uh, 2008 constitution. And that is kind of like the, really the cornerstone, the foundation of so many things thereafter in terms of civil military relations, in terms of state society relations, and in terms of central periphery or central local relations. And it was, the argument goes, never meant to really reach full democracy. It is a designed transition to some kind of hybrid form of rule. Also enabled by changing international relations in Southeast Asia. And then this has implications for outcomes in terms of civil military relations, in terms of state society or the democratic chain. And not the least, and, uh, and uh, for me this is my main interest at the moment, uh, for central local or relations or resolution of Myanmar's long-standing intrastate conflicts. So then you can uh, start to talk about what are the implications, what are the outcomes of this kind of imposed transition in terms of conflict resolution. And just a couple of points. First is, of course, that we're seeing a peace process that is centered on ceasefire agreements, not conflict resolution. So it is a strategy to achieve what Yuan Galtung in the old days called negative peace, rather than conflict transformation. And the pressure on the actors to come under that process and accept the terms and handle the core issues through parliamentary rather than extra parliamentary means. Uh, another leg in this is state reform itself, decentralization, and the argument by, that you hear from some that Myanmar is already to some extent federal in nature, that there is an element of federalism in the constitution. The counter argument is that this is at most very limited 
administrative deconcentration. Sorry, time to stop, it seems. <laughs> uh, uh, with little real devolution of power or power sharing, falling far short of the demand for self-determination -de and uh, federalism that the ethnic organizations have been fought for for a long time. And a third element is what some scholars call ceasefire capitalism, meaning that these ceasefire arrangements are also opportunities and justifications for development investment in stabilized zones by military interests, by their cronies, by foreign direct investors and others. And uh, the justification is of course that Myanmar after so many years of mismanagement and underdevelopment is in high need of development investments, no doubt about that. But without resolution of these core grievances regarding power sharing and self-determination. All kinds of investments, especially then in natural resource extraction, which is to a large extent located in ethnic states, is highly controversial because it impacts and limits the future of possibilities for a, a real federal or real conflict resolution based on federalism. Um, and uh, the third point was then really, I'm just going to mention what it was quickly. The third point, point that I wanted to make was that, well, we have seen uh, uh, the, the winning of an election, the establishment of a de democratic government since 2016. And that has become quite a complex political story itself. And I think that the foremost lesson that we take away from that is that about the need for what you could call transformative democratic politics to deepen democracy, to transform civil military relations, and to not the least resolve the conflicts themselves. So then the question is like, what are the actors? What are the strategies, the capacities, the intervention points for support in building agendas, alliances for what you could call a more substantive democratization? And then this is about, of course, NLD. It's about the complexity of ethnic armed organizations and alliances. It is very much about political parties and not the least about civil society organizations, especially the politically organized or oriented civil society organizations and the alliances and strategies in these assemblages. I'll stop there. Thank you. And then it's Roman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, in the second part of our presentation of the report, I would like to focus on the economic side of Myanmar's development, and in particular um, on the risks for international engagement. That is also uh, a very important part of our report, and the report is also uh, available freely uh, online. You can download it. But I'll, I would like to articulate some of the main points that we uh, <clears throat> found uh, in the report. Uh, and in our study. So first of all, uh, let's have a quick um, look at the main um, tendencies, I would say, uh, as regards Myanmar's economic outlook. And the first thing is that, uh, well, Myanmar uh, at the moment is one of the fastest growing economies uh, in the Southeast Asia, with the uh, annual uh, growth rate of around 7-8%. And the same uh, growth rate is also uh, predicted for the next uh, five to 10 years. Uh, factors for explaining this is that, well, the country has opened up. Um, it has raised interest from many uh, international investors, uh, also donors. Also, the country has very young population. That is also a very important factor that support this high economic growth. Uh, at the same time, um, there is still a huge um, uh, I would say factors that uh, and obstacles um, that, of course, preclude the the, the country from uh, using 
this economic growth for the benefit of the entire society. And that's the fact that, well, uh, the, uh, the, the share of informal society, uh, of informal economy, sorry, is among the largest in the world. So that's the fact for, for Myanmar. Um, and um, given this very complex situation, as uh, Christian has just presented, uh, well, it's, it's never easy to, uh, to deal uh, uh, and to try to tackle these, uh, well, informal practices in the country. And just to give you one example to illustrate this point is that, well, uh, given this state of, con of conflict and the questioned legitimacy of the state in some of the uh, uh, ethnic uh, parts of the country, um, uh, many international donors were trying to come up with an idea of formalizing, for example, formalizing trade, trade between uh, uh, Myanmar and China. However, in, the, in these areas, uh, formalizing the, for example, trade channels would mean that the uh, income would be redirected towards the state, and this would, of course, undermine the local uh, societies and communities that benefit from having informal trade with the neighboring, uh, for example, countries. And as a result, I mean, uh, coming up with this agenda of formalizing informal trade is, I think, is a bit too premature because this can actually worsen the uh, conflict situation in this area. At the same time, we also see, since the opening up of the country in 2012, we see some uh, positive trends when it comes to the overall perception of transparency. So the country uh, made a, uh, moved forward from 157 to uh, in 1213 to 136 out of uh, 180 countries in 2016. Uh, uh, some authors claim that, well, this can also be attributed to the fact that there's more data available uh, in the country about the uh, economic situation, but also about the corruption practices. But also some uh, point out that, well, there's also some gradual uh, increase in terms of this, uh, in terms of uh, uh, b battling the corruption. However, when it comes to the overall sustainability of Myanmar's economic reforms, there's uh, also another very important uh, obstacle that can actually uh, threaten the uh, successful use of this high uh, economic growth, and that's the limited experience of the current government when it comes to the economic reform process. Uh, and this is one of the major challenges, and uh, while the, the external help may not compensate for this uh, lack of uh, experience with the economic reforms. Another very important point I would like to focus is the issue of development cooperation. We know that Myanmar has been one of the most popular destinations for um, development aid in the recent years. And uh, just one uh, figure would show that how important Myanmar became, and uh, it faced 788% increase in foreign aid in just one year, from 2012 to 2013. And, it, and this trend has actually continued since 2013. Which means that, yes, there's a very big interest from international donors. Uh, and at the same time, we know that also Myanmar is at, the, at this, a very critical uh, stage in its development, uh, where actually international donors can play a big role and they can actually shape the course of the reforms. And uh, for example, Myanmar is being very dynamic and uh, very volatile compared to other developing countries, um, can actually have a bigger impact from international donors because it's so dynamic uh, at the moment. And in this regard, of course, as also as um, Kristen was uh, mentioning it. It's very important that the development aid that comes is very, uh, very much taking into account the local context, as well as it has to be very smart just in order to consider this whole complexity of interests involved. Um, and the last point I'd like to uh, focus is the, what are the main risks for external engagement? And in our report, we have around uh, 20 different types of risks that you can see can be divided into contextual risks, programmatic and institutional risks, uh, with a different degree of impact from short-term to the long-term perspectives. And I would like to uh, stop and uh, highlight the main three that I think um, can be very important for uh, our understanding of what's happening in the country at the moment. So first is that, uh, well, the economic growth, while being, of course, very uh, significant, uh, well, there's a risk that it may not be very inclusive um, because we also know that while well, some parts of the country have very limited access in terms of the uh, cooperation with donors as well as in terms of uh, making uh, foreign, uh, uh, well, uh, investment. And in this, in this sense, if the development continues, 
there's a risk of very unequal uh, distribution of uh, economic benefits that in turn may have a very negative impact on countries' uh, development because this would lead to even further deepening the gap between different parts of the country. Also, another very important concern uh, for the country, um, as well as for international donors that deal with Myanmar, is the limited political and technical capacity for democratic transformation. And here I mean the lack of uh, administering the country, especially at the uh, local uh, governance level, and also the ability to absorb international assistance as well as the absor to absorb uh, foreign uh, uh, direct investment that comes in the country. And finally, uh, there is a very important factor of uh, unpredictability, and uh, the entire political economic environment in Myanmar is very dynamic. This is not to say that what we are talking about today can be outdated next week, but at least you know we know that it's very, uh, very much uh, a dynamic situation, which means that the all actors involved in dealing with Myanmar have to be always sort of update and always uh, informed about what's happening, um, and of course many. Uh, projects of international organizations, they have very long uh, periods of uh, sort of so-called feasibility studies when they need one a year or even more just to do the design of a project, which to the point of being um, opened is already outdated because it doesn't really account for the current reality. So these are the main risks, but this is not, of course, not the whole list. And at this point, I'd like to stop and thank you uh, for your attention. So, uh, dear excellencies, friends, colleagues, it's a, it's a great pleasure, as you said, for me as a Norwegian to come home and uh, speak in a, in a greatly regarded place like Nupi. I'm very honored to be invited to, to speak here. I'm very happy that old friends and even uh, members of my family have shown up to see me here today. So. Uh, um, and I found this report extremely interesting. Uh, I, uh, I would like to congratulate Nupi and the authors very much on, on, on this report. I, I'm thinking, while well, I'm seeing this presentation, about uh, various ways I can use graphics is so powerful when you try to discuss these things and, and, and use this information in our work. Um, I, um, I want to talk more about the dimension on how we work, how we try to work, how we try to engage, what factors influence that in Myanmar right now. Uh, as you heard, my job is to try to coordinate the work of the UN system in Myanmar. Uh, we have many challenges, but also I think the important part is we have many opportunities, like some of those that you, you, you mentioned. Let me quote from this publication. Uh, it states in, in the opening paragraph that it is important for international assistance to design and implement potentially smart strategies in support of substantive democracy and peace. And I'd like to come back to that point because I think it's so crucial in, in the work that we do. Uh, I, I tend to try to come back to this in various ways in, in my work and my, my uh, discussions at, in Myanmar. We must remain engaged. Uh, also in difficult times. But at the same time, we have to be critical and our engagement has to be constructive and principled. And uh, this is some of the reasons why. Myanmar has just emerged and is continuing to emerge from 50 years of military regime. Many people still live in rural areas. Every third person lives under the poverty line. Only 37% has access to electricity. One in five has access to financial services. And this, among other things, places, of course, Myanmar in the least development, developed countries group. In addition, on the humanitarian side, there's 800,000 people now, we estimate, in need of imme immediate humanitarian assistance. And there's still a long way to go on transition to democracy and to overcome ongoing conflicts, as we saw on some of these maps. Uh, the UN and the international community in the face of these challenges, we need to continue to support the men, women, and children in need of humanitarian and development assistance, irrespective of their ethnicity, religion, and citizenship status. 
We are all committed to leaving no one behind. We signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty in all its forms and realize human rights for everyone uh, without discrimination by 2030. The UN has a long tradition of development cooperation in Myanmar. But since August last year, international attention on Myanmar has been on something else than Myanmar's sustainable development. We, in media almost daily, uh, we've seen and we continue to see the extreme tragedy in northern Rakhine state with burning houses, destroyed lands, grave human rights violations, and Rohingya Muslims in very difficult conditions trying to make their way over the border to unsecure living conditions in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is now hosting nearly 1 million refugees along its borders, and 700,000 of those newly arrived. Senior UN human rights officials, the Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Chair of the Fact-Finding Mission, speaking in the Human Rights Council a little less than two weeks ago, uh, they presented the reports de detailing atrocities using words such as ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, and even genocide. The uh, the tension of two Reuters journalists reporting on these events have prompted accompanying concerns about the state of press freedom and freedom of speech in the country. There are growing calls among UN member states for accountability measures, for example, uh, ICC indictments and sanctions for senior military officials. Because of all these news headlines, there's a growing debate on how to best engage in Myanmar in a constructive and ethical manner. How to do good while avoid doing harm and while um, avoid making things worse at the same time. To do that, we will need to recognize that Myanmar is much more than Rakhine State. And I think this report is one of the dimensions that makes this extremely clear. Many issues need our attention. And uh, Myanmar is in fact going through three transition processes, which I've been actually in our work locally, to have been talking about for quite some time, and I find these three transitions that we've been talking about is extremely similar to the three dimensions that you, you use in this presentation. I'm, the way I express it is there is the uh, transition from dictatorship to democracy, there's a transition from conflict to peace, and there's a transition from a closed to an open economy. This, we're pointing out the same things, obviously, because we, we talk about the same country and the same problems. Uh, I strongly me think Myanmar needs to address all these three transitions simultaneously and with our help to be able to also resolve the problems with the immediate crisis. These things cannot be seen in isolation. But let me give you some recent examples of UN projects, initiatives that works more on the development side to, to help Myanmar move towards the 2030 vision of ending poverty. Uh, and to address these transition processes. There was, uh, 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 for example, a civil, su civil service reform action plan launched last year by the uh, state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi. The action plan was developed by UNDP in partnership with the Union Civil Service Board, and it's based on nationwide comprehensive consultations and uh, offers concrete steps to change the civil service to be meritocratic, equalitarian, and to include civil service. Uh, uh, and this is built in the, in the visions of this plan. In 2017, UNICEF, WHO, and Gavi supported the Ministry of Health and Sports to immunize over 13 and a half million children uh, from nine months to 15 years across the whole country against Japanese encephalitis. No? Uh, this is only one of the diseases you should vaccinate against. But the point I'm trying to make is we were able to reach the whole country, also those areas that sometimes are considered no-go areas, by this cooperation. So it can be done. Um, the UNOPS managed lift fund is closing the enormous gap in the supply and access to financial services across the country. Uh, UNOPS supports 64 financial institutions that collectively reaches 1.7 million clients. This is 64% of the total microfinance market at this point in Myanmar. UDP has helped increase legal professionals and communities' awareness of rule of law through the establishment of four rule of law centers in Mandalay, Michina, Tongye, and Yangon. Each of these centers have trained 
thousands of civil servants and community leaders on rights. The idea is you may, of course, disc uh, discuss or uh, criticize the laws we have in the country now, but they do give a number of rights. And one of the deficiencies is that people are not aware of these rights and how to apply existing rights. So that already is a step forward. We plan to open another rule of law center in Rakhine State now with support from Japan. UDP, with support from Norway, among others, has since 2016 been supporting the Joint Ceasefire Monitoring Committee with technical, financial, and institutional support, which is an important support to the peace process. The key to moving forward and succeeding in these things is national ownership. Uh, also, the NUPI report was talking about engagement. Uh, we cannot really achieve anything by imposing things from the other side. We, we need to find ways to engage with those, and I like very much your table of the different types of actors, with those who are open to change. When we work together with national institutions, we have the potential to reach everybody, to leave nobody behind. Our challenge is that we don't have the same engagement, we don't have the same access in all types of our work. For example, uh, the crisis affecting northern Rakhine state, uh, we don't have much access. We don't have, many people are deprived of life-saving humanitarian assistance because of the lack of access there. And it also goes for some of the conflict areas in the north and the, and the east. Um, since the attacks on 25th August, only a few permissions have been granted for UN agencies and international NGOs to work in the northern part of Rakhine state. WFP was granted some access in November 2017, and they continue to distribute relief, food and nutrition assistance. Now they're up to a, a goal of 66,000 people. Uh, this is up from 49,000 people last month, but it's still a long way to go to, to get the access we need. When we have access in Rakhine, the aid is delivered to all people, uh, disregarding the ethnic, uh, uh, status, religion, citizenship status. We, we must deliver assistance to Rohingyas, to ethnic Rakhines, to other ethnic groups. Otherwise, we will undermine our own, our own work. Uh, we should ask ourselves constantly, are we reaching everyone as we have promised in this 2030 agenda? And obviously, we are not. Because of lack of access, uh, we don't know how many people remain in Rakhine. We don't know exactly what their needs are. And therefore, we're constantly calling on the government to provide unfettered humanitarian access and to ensure the safe, voluntary, dignified, and sustainable return of refugees from Bangladesh to their place of origin. We are also trying to do something similar to what the NIPI report recommends, to design politically smart strategies for, for what we do. To a strategy that could address root causes at the same time as it addresses humanitarian needs. Uh, we have we used a lot of a, a lot of references to the Rakhine Advisory Commission report that came out in August last year. Uh, it with its 88 recommendations, even though it came out before this latest crisis, it's still extremely relevant. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, we had what I hope will be a breakthrough, but we cannot be sure yet that it is a breakthrough. We were approached uh, by government to invite UNDP and UNHCR uh, to have consultations about conditions for safe, voluntary, dignified and sustainable return of refugees from Bangladesh. Uh, the scope that they wanted to discuss was all those refugees who have uh, left since uh, October 2016. These are enormous numbers. They live in absolutely dismal conditions in Bangladesh with no clear uh, future, and, uh, in, and they cannot stay where they are, and they don't have any other option for where to go. So this is extremely important, but it's also extremely difficult. So the teams from these agencies are now trying to work out smart strategies. Uh, how can we deal with the, uh, the conditions for return in their place of origin? Uh, which needs to cover so many different things from rights to livelihoods, uh, social sector, uh, physical things, as well as the legal and identity issues related to their returns. Uh, these projects need to reflect the peace, humanitarian development nexus, uh, and 
there needs to be work first to prepare the ground for sustainable return because exactly today the conditions are not in place for return. Uh, but to make this happen, we have to complete our consultations with government. We do not yet have an agreement with government for how, how this will be done. We have a promising start. It's received a lot of attention. We receive a lot of questions about this. But we, uh, we still have some ways to go just to, to make the agreements uh, the way they should be. We are coming from two different places, I think, for how this should happen. We need to bring those together so that it actually can happen. Uh, we need full access. We need uh, commitment from both sides that we will do the right things and we'll do it in the right way. And we do need to make sure human rights is at the base of everything we do. This is the case for all UN projects. They're all based on a human rights-based uh, approach to programming. There does not need to be any conflict between human rights and development, or human rights and delivery of humanitarian assistance. As several of our UN Secretary Generals have said many times, these go closely together, and you cannot succeed sustainably to achieve one without the other. The UN country team in Myanmar is committed to the so-called Human Rights Upfront Initiative. This, the purpose of this is to mobilize those who are not experts on human rights. Uh, we have some specialist organizations and people, of course, but we want to mobilize the whole system to support the achievement and production of human rights. For example, through advocacy, early warning, early response, and other mechanisms. We need to remain principled. Uh, whether it's our position on freedom of movement, uh, right to free speech, or the arrest of Reuters journalists, we cannot waver on our principles. I, I was asked in this in an interview uh, a few months ago, and uh, I said, we, if we start compromising the principles, then we undermine our work. Um, but we have to keep in mind also that our humanitarian work and development work is urgent. We cannot sit still. Uh, I want to stress that uh, we need to move forward while we are applying our principles. Uh, for the situation in Rakhine, what has happened there, accountability is very important. Perpetrators should be held responsible. But while this accountability process moves forward, which could take years, we have to recognize there's almost a million refugees with immediate needs. That cannot wait. We cannot sit still and wait for all things to be perfect. We need to take action to reach the people in need and help them in any way we can. We need to, while we are addressing the immediate needs, work on the three transitions, the ones Nupi pointed out, the ones I mentioned. Uh, and I very much agree with your concluding points that external actors can make a difference. But only when we move forward and do things, not when we sit still. Uh, and also only when we engage and work with the national actors. This is the only way forward to reach everybody and to move towards the 2030 promise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if the speakers would now like to join me up here, we'll open the floor for questions and comments. And uh, when you, uh, anybody who wants to, to, uh, up to you, um, <coughs> anybody who wants to ask a question or uh, make a comment, um, you have to use the microphone, which Anna at the back will bring around to you. And also, uh, uh, our speakers here also should use uh, the microphone. <coughs> right. Um, I have, I mean, I could easily fill this whole session myself. <laughs> so since there are, I don't see any questions quite yet, so I'm quite happy to, to use the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> um, so I, I thought maybe uh, first uh, I could start with Knut um, and, and first make a, a comment and then a, 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 or a, a, make a point of my own and then ask a question. Um, so my, my point is that um, it seems to me that one of the main drivers for the opening of Myanmar that we've had in recent years is um, a desire on the part of powerful actors in Myanmar 
to, to loosen a little bit the Chinese grip on the country um, and to have a little bit more uh, independence from China. Um, my question then is, uh, if, we, if Western countries uh, become very critical of the treatment of the Rohingya, of uh, other uh, ethnic issues in Myanmar, uh, <coughs> which obviously there is a, a, a strong basis for, for being very critical about, um, is there a risk that we uh, drive Myanmar uh, back to China? <coughs> and then um, I think I'll do three questions, one for each of you. Uh, <coughs> Christian, um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was seen uh, as kind of a human rights uh, democracy hero in the West. Um, have, have we been, have, has the West been naive? And is there a tendency on the Western part to create uh, black and white pictures? Uh, well, I would say, oh, yes, there is a tendency of the, uh, to, to create black and white pictures in general in many contexts. But is this, is this one case? Where we, there, there are some uh, uh, bad guys in Myanmar, there are some good guys, and uh, she's one of the good guys. And then finally to Roman, um, could you say a bit more about the speed of economic reform uh, in Myanmar? Uh, are we in a situation where we basically have, um, well, we have the, the former military, which is still very much, uh, it still has a lot of power, and which doesn't have a, a very strong track record on reform. Um, and we have uh, former dissidents who were very uh, strong as dissidents, uh, but maybe uh, running an economy is a bit different from uh, pro protesting about democracy. So <clears throat> I, that could be one explanation why it's going slowly. And the other one could be that there are, understandably, very many distractions. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has made uh, one of her main aims to, to solve the, um, the conflicts between the center and the various ethnic groups in the country. And it's understandable that in this context, uh, there isn't, uh, they don't have much time to deal with, with economic issues. Um, on the other hand, this seems very risky because uh, the population expects uh, economic uh, progress and improvement. Um, and some of the, some economic reforms are difficult to carry out and should perhaps have been carried out early on during the, the honeymoon period and maybe even more difficult in the future. So if you could sum up a bit on this. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this uh, issue of the relation to China is very important. Uh, I agree with you. They, it's very clear Myanmar has been very dependent on China in the past, and it's also very clear they have deliberately wanted to reach out and have more friends in, in the world. And as you pointed out, there is there's a risk to that policy uh, now. There is. It seems to be some retraction from that now. And uh, how how would let's say Western countries you talked about, is also us from the UN. We are critical to the country and, I, uh, and uh, does that scare the country from working with us? Uh, I think the, the question is, how do we criticize? The, the, I think uh, Myanmar is very complex, as you said, but we can, uh, I think complex problems sometimes have very simple answers. The, if you think about disagreements in a, in a household, if my uh, wife would criticize me from not cleaning the table after breakfast or something. Um, and she could say, uh, I never clean the table and it's part of my personality that uh, I will always keep a messy household. Or she could say, um, you didn't clean the uh, table today, I would like you to do that. So you can imagine how you would react differently to those different approaches. And I think this is the case from Myanmar. Some of this criticism is like that. It's a country of 51 million people, and some of the international voices are actually implicitly asking us to treat all of them as bad or all of them as good. And then obviously in this case bad. And that obviously doesn't work. Your, I think your table gives the answer. There are some people who want to move things forward. They have limited space, so the criticism, our approach from the outside, needs to 
if it's going to have an effect, needs to work with these people uh, and help them work within their uh, political space to make change. Uh, I think one of the principles is that uh, we need to talk more about what should be done, while of course we talk about what should not be done, but to, to identify positive opportunities to move things forward, po positive opportunities for change. And I think this is not easy, that there's a gap of trust, there is a limited political space, but I think with that approach we have been able to make some progress and we can make more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, big question. How to understand Aung San Suu Kyi? Uh, this, uh, <laughs> this has become a kind of a hobby, not the least among uh, Young Gon's circles, uh, to, uh, to try to analyze uh, the lady and what she's up to and how to make sense of what she's doing. Uh, the general narrative is that uh, she's a fallen democracy icon. Uh, and uh, the question is then, what happened to her? I think that obviously uh, some things have changed in, in what she does, maybe also how she thinks, I'm not so sure about that. But it is also very much reflective of how we have constructed her, how we have understood her. Uh, when we, we constructed her as a democracy icon, although there, we could have also had different representation some of the things we see now, we could, in retrospect, say that there were signs of it before uh, in, in her expressions and, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think that the more interesting question is not so much about uh, understanding her psyche or uh, political thinking, although that is important, but it is also to understand her agency in a context, in a structural context. What are the limitations? What, how is that shaping her? Uh, there are definitely things she could do. She could speak more, she could explain, she could build political alliances, she could be more inclusive. But we also have to keep in mind the context that she's, uh, within which she is uh, operating. And uh, obviously, what we have seen, as, or you can say that in the last year or so, there's been a remarkable shift in the international discourse, not only on Aung San Suu Kyi, but also about what kind of political system do we see in Myanmar today. Uh, before August 25, it was very much about, the, still very much about the democratic transition. Uh, Myanmar being on a path to some kind of endpoint that would be democratic. Now, the discourse is very much about democracy being a semi-authoritarian, hybrid form of rule. Uh, we see much more clearly the, 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 the strong influence of the military. But we also see much more clearly a more immediate context around Aung San Suu Kyi, which is about the party, party politics, the state apparatus, and so on and so forth. That she is in some... Well, we wrote an article a few years ago about political parties in Myanmar, where we said that many parties are, um, are uh, bodies without heads, or in the case of NLD, it is in some ways a, the, the opposite thing. It is very much about Aung San Suu Kyi, but the organizational capacity of the party around her was very poorly equipped for what happened in 2015-2016. So she is a, she's in a very tough spot, uh, but she's not necessarily always making, or she's not making the most out of that space that she has, <coughs> after all. Could I just add, a, extend the question a little bit? Uh, sometimes it seems to me like the, 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 the military in Myanmar have been incredibly intelligent in, in allowing, uh, relatively open uh, or partially open elections and having this opening uh, which gives access to uh, a lot of international cooperation and capital and allows them to become uh, quite respectable uh, and at the same time uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, can be 
uh, can take the blame. Like, for example, my question for Roman, if, if economic forms are not successful, uh, if, if uh, there's something with uh, uh, ethnic minorities, she, she can also be blamed for a lot of this. So w is what you're saying that she's basically a hostage? But, but, but if she is a hostage, shouldn't she be making so, a little more kind of sound of some kind? Kind of, help, help. I, 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 don't, I'm, I don't need to apologize for Aung San Suu Kyi. <laughs> uh, yes, it sounds like, I, I, it might sound uh, like she's a hostage, but, uh, but she al also always said that uh, to the West, use your freedom to speak up for our freedom. And uh, you could say that one thing that she ought to do it is at least to, stand to, to use the increased freedom to speak up that she has. Uh, another thing that she uh, that I find very disappointing is that she has not used the space that she has to build uh, what I would call progressive alliances for transformative democratic politics. She was voted into power on uh, on a broad popular mandate, including from ethnic constituencies. Uh, but since coming into power, uh, it seems that uh, they have been totally unable or unwilling to, to uh, draw on that alliance uh, and to extend it and to bring that into peace negotiations or, or other things. So uh, to maintain a, or, or to maintain her main asset and to, draw, uh, to turn that into a political action, which is people's power, uh, is uh, to me as disappointing as her um, inability to speak up in a principled way uh, on, for instance, the Rohingya crisis. Um, well, thank you, Indra. Uh, good question. Uh, indeed, if we ask how fast um, our economic reforms, well, one could say definitely yeah, it has been quite slow, or of course it can be, it can, it could move much faster than it's moving at the moment. Um, and as you rightly said, um, uh, while many uh, actors that participate in economic reform process, among whom are also former uh, dissidents, they have a uh, limited experience, uh, well, and also technical capacity to implement economic reforms, uh, especially in such a complex country as Myanmar. Um, but at the same time, uh, with this, I mean, there are also certain limits to how fast it can go. And there are limits not only on the government side, um, limited experience, limited technical capacity, but also there's limits in terms of the, uh, to what extent the private sector is receptive of these reforms. For example, uh, in Myanmar, there has not been a norm of paying taxes to the state. I mean, it maybe now is just emerging, but we know that, well, the taxation as such didn't exist in Myanmar for many years. It, ha it had some formal forms, but it wasn't really there. Uh, and uh, the private sector is very um, um, distrustful of the government. Um, at the same time, uh, as I said also during the presentation, the uh, many businesses participate in the informal economy, and I, I would say that it would take years for them to, uh, well, to become formal, because, I mean, there's a high degree of, uh, well, there's lack of trust towards to what extent the government can really uh, provide and be fair in terms of the distri uh, redistributing economic uh, benefits in the country. And another very important point also, uh, and this relates to the issue of complexity, is that uh, it's not only the, the lack of experience, but also the government is facing a lots of different very important issues, and they have a challenge in terms of prioritizing things, like uh, they have to deal with the Rohingya issue, they also have to deal with the economic reforms. Also, they have like a numerous international donors who come basically every day knocking on the doors and just uh, offering new projects. And so for them, it's a, it's a matter of, you know, of trying to articulate their priorities. And uh, I think first this has to be done in order to move forward and try to accelerate the uh, reform path. Thank you. And we now have a question from Hider. Could you please introduce yourself before? Um, hi, is this working? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Hira Brekus. Um, I, I don't have much knowledge about these issues and I don't work on them currently, um, but, but I'm interested in, um, in the Rohingya issue and the, um, 
the the Myanmar government seems to be consistently making the case that uh, it is not a separate ethnic group, uh, that they are to be considered Bengalis. Why why are they making this argument? I, I'd be I'd be interested in in understanding that point of view, um, ext extending um, that, that question on the Rohingya issue. Um, how what are the channels for communication between the Bangladeshi and the Myanmar governments, um, and is there an element of rivalry between Sheikh Hasina and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi? Does that play into the issue at all? And and also um, to um, uh, regarding the UN more, more specifically, how how is the UN in Myanmar and Bangladesh able to coordinate, and which which agencies with regards to the Rohingya crisis have been most important, uh, the the IOM or the UNHCR or or other agencies? Thank you. That was, <coughs> since that was three questions, I think we, we will deal with them now. <coughs> okay. So it's for me most, uh, some of them, yes. so I can try. And then you can give your also version. So uh, the Rohingya, the use of the word Rohingya has been much debated, right? And the, even the special re rapporteur for human rights, uh, Yang Hini in the Human Rights Council <coughs> made a special point on that. We do, I, we do recognize very much the uh, right of the Rohingyas to self-identify as Rohingya. That's uh, how we see it, but we are not uh, from our side, defining them as a separate ethnic group. They do that themselves. But we recognize the right to self-identify. Now, on, if we then turn around and look at what is the government of Myanmar saying and why are they saying this? And, and I have heard all these arguments. I, I can re represent them to you, but I, I can't say I necessarily agree with them. But uh, the, the argument is that the word Rohingya in uh, some uh, Bengali language would mean a person from Rohin, which is another name for Rakhine state uh, from the past. Uh, so implicit in the word Rohingya in their interpretation is that uh, Rohingya means uh, a person from uh, the Rakhine state. And uh, also implicit in that, as they build on this logic, comes that they are the only real inhabitants of a uh, Rakhine state. And uh, they have, and then again, building on that, they have the right to succeed, secede and make Rakhine into a separate state ruled by the Rohingyas. Uh, so this is the sort of argument, the logic, as it goes. I'm not, this is not my logic, but this is how it goes. Uh, so from that, from if you were to see it from that perspective, you could see there's a certain political nervousness about the political consequences of using this, uh, this, this word. Now, um, communications uh, between the two countries, they have been blaming each other, as you see on the returns issue, they have been blaming each other, but they have, it has not escalated too much, but they have not been that friendly. They have been disagreeing on who is to blame, why the refugee returns have not started. They, you know, they signed a bilateral agreement that said returns will start 23rd of January. They didn't start. They're blaming each other for why it is not starting, um, etc. And before they signed the agreement, they blamed each other for why they could not uh, get an agreement. Uh, but I think it's being kept under control by, by dialogue at several levels, at the uh, ministerial level mostly, but they also have a working group uh, under this returns agreement uh, that is actively meeting regularly and they discussed several sort of sub-agreements for technical arrangements, etc. And specifically, for example, uh, you have had a population on the border uh, which has been the subject of dispute and there's been uh, military mobilization, mobilization from the Myanmar side which has been then criticized by Bangladesh side and they have uh, um, sorted some of that out through meetings between the military commanders on the border. So there's these several dialogues going on, but clearly the countries do not have an easy relationship. I don't see the dimension about Sheikh Hasina and Aung San Suu Kyi as rivals. I think they're operating in, in two different political spaces. Sheikh Hasina, of course, has elections coming up in a few months. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has elections coming up in 2020, which is a bit further away, but you could also already feel, feel that. But I don't think 
the two influence each other so much. But for Sheikh Hasina, the presence of one million refugees is clearly one of the parameters uh, that she has to consider for election preparations. Um, on the United Nations, Bangladesh, Myanmar, we have had too little communications in the past. We have started to communicate more. I communicate on a regular basis with the coordinator there. And um, we've had uh, uh, a couple of consultations between the UN teams as such. Uh, we are uh, doing better on this. Uh, we have discussed uh, some cross-border projects, uh, but we have we have still a long way to go on this, but we, we recognize the need and we've done something. Last point on IOM versus UNHCR. Initially in Cox Bazar on the Bangladesh side, uh, there, it was mostly IOM who, who took the, I mean, uh, who took the lead in terms of dealing with the um, the refugees, the role normally taken by UNHCR, but now UNHCR is playing the main role. Uh, there was some discussion, but that's now, now sorted out. There are many other UN agencies. Um, I can't remember exactly all of them. There are six UN agencies, plus a number of NGOs operating in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, but of course, mainly those dealing with uh, humanitarian assistance. This is not the place for development assistance at the moment. This is uh, water sanitation, food, uh, health, uh, etc., and protection, shelter, that sort of work going on. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick comments on the Rohingya. Um, uh, one thing is, of course, the, uh, the construction of categories and uh, and here you have basically two totally opposed narratives one saying that uh, this is uh, not only a group that has a very distinct identity but a long history as such and a, and a long history of presence in Rakhine and the other saying that no they are foreigners uh, and uh, both can uh, selectively pick up on uh, pieces of evidence and uh, use it or abuse it to in, in favor of their story. I think that, uh, so that's important in itself, but the second layer is the political use of these categories, the politicization of identities. And uh, that goes for the Rohingya side, but certainly on the, on, uh, in, in Myanmar politics. So, uh, Explicitly or implicitly, uh, there is a there is a politics around the Rohingya, and that is not just about the Rohingya, but it is also about the power game between the key actors in in Myanmar politics. So you, you, it's difficult to identify or to point out or find evidence, uh, find a smoking gun of what different actors do. But you can you can think quite you can deduce things by by asking the question like who stand to gain from this. What kind of political uh, campaign agenda stand to gain or lose from this becoming a political uh, contentious issue? <clears throat> okay, I think we will, uh, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, <clears throat> Per Jørgen Horen uh, and I am retired. Uh, I should like to, <coughs> to know, if you know, uh, the value of uh, the oil and gas outside the, uh, the Muslim area in uh, Myanmar, and also the value of the pipelines from that area to China. It is two pipelines, one with gas and one with oil. What is the values of these things compared to the other? Things which can be taken out from Malaysia, from uh, from um, Myanmar, um, and also why also this uh, uh, Muslim population has been transferred by the Englishmen from uh, from um, Bangladesh uh, to Myanmar. Um, why can they not continue to stay where they come from originally and be held there? They have been living there for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Why can they not continue to live there? And why can we not help them there? Because this is something which the Englishmen have created. And third, point three, uh, Singapore, the same history, 
that it was Chinese people transferred to, China, to um, Malaysia. Um, and uh, now it is um, uh, um, um, a separate country. Singapore is a, um, can be considered as a country. And it is a very, very big threat for Chinese transport shipping passing to the Middle East. It's one of, I guess, one of the biggest fortresses in the world in uh, Singapore, controlling, uh, controlling uh, the ship, uh, also the ship transport passing there, controlled by USA. And that is a neighbor country, and people, of course, in Myanmar, they speak about these things. Why, can you say something about this? First, the value of the oil and gas and the pipeline. One more uh, question from here, if you can remember the, the questions we have now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the good presentation. My name is Mohammed. Uh, I am a student of public international law uh, master program at the University of Oslo. Uh, my, I don't know it's question or comment, uh, but in China is it uh, the same uh, situation, uh, a uh, cruel uh, violation of human rights against Muslim minority, but why it's in uh, international community it's silent. Um, not only say uh, about uh, Myanmar, uh, Palestine, uh, Syria, but about the Uyghur people don't say anything. Yeah. But, right, you, you mean that the international community is silent about China yeah. or about yeah. Myanmar? Yeah, about China, yeah. About China. Yeah. Right. Uh, anybody uh, have uh, neat answers to these questions? Or other <laughs> answers? <laughs> Not on the oil and gas value. Uh, I don't have a on that. No. Maybe while you're thinking, I'll say something about oil and gas yeah. value. No, not that I have an answer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, some of uh, Myanmar's richest areas for oil and gas are offshore of uh, Myanmar and close to the shore. Uh, and as you say, it has two pipelines to China. And um, I think uh, we don't know the value of the oil and gas that's been piped to China. Um, uh, for sure, and also because this is, uh, even if you can work out the volumes going, you don't know the price that they're getting because it's not necessarily an international price. Uh, and we certainly don't know the future potential uh, for oil and gas uh, in Myanmar onshore or offshore. Uh, we know that Statoil uh, recently uh, withdrew from or decided to withdraw from Myanmar. And uh, I think some other international oil companies are also uh, not very enthusiastic, uh, much less enthusiastic than they were uh, in the past. Um, whether that's based mainly on geological uh, considerations or to what extent also on other uh, considerations is difficult to say. So basically there isn't a clear answer. How much uh, is this worth? But I think... Uh, uh, Myan it, what is clear is that Myanmar does have an oil and gas potential, which goes back a long time. It's, it's been a, it was a major oil producer, uh, also as, as part of the British Empire, um, and uh, uh, this this will be a factor in uh, considerations by various actors in Myanmar. Um, then there was you had another question about. Uh, Muslims, uh, basically, I guess, in your view, coming from Bangladesh, why can't they just be in Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I can say something on this. You might have more detailed information than me, because you did a lot of research. But uh, I, I know I can say something on this. It's, but let, can I also comment briefly on this oil and gas issue? Because I think it put, points to uh, an important sort of uh, uh, political, economical point, which is, uh, of course, economic interests drive some of these things. And I think it's important to be aware, in addition to what you said, that Myanmar also has a lot of uh, jade, gemstones, uh, and there is drug production that drives the economy in some of these conflict areas. Some of these uh, conflicts, uh, I mean, the, some of these armies uh, of the non-state groups are financed by drug trafficking, by illegal trading, illegal logging, illegal trading of this gemstone. So the economic factor is, I think that's what you're driving to, is, a, is an important factor in this. But unfortunately, I don't have this exact number either. Um, now, on the Muslims uh, transferred by the British, etc., this is uh, um, a, a lot of 
uh, disagreement on this point. I, don't, I have not been able to find a clear story. It is clear that already like 500 years ago, there were Muslim traders coming and settling in this area during the Mughal times in, uh, in India. There's been several migrations since then. But I think in recent times, as you point out, during the British, the numbers have significantly increased. Uh, there is a citizenship law of 1982, which is much disputed, but uh, I think it gives those who came into the country before uh, independence, before independence in 48, that gives them certain rights to, to stay. The question is to document that. Uh, so there's a recognition of that, but there's also a claim that many people came after that. Uh, and I'm not sure how we're going to get to the bottom of exactly who is who, but there is an, there is an ongoing uh, debate. And uh, Bangladesh uh, clearly says that uh, these people do not are not residents of Bangladesh. These people themselves say they're not residents of the Bangladesh. And uh, again, coming back to the fact that they have lived there for generations, uh, and to respect their individual rights, we should respond to 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 that. Um, at the same time, of course, we need to re respect the position of the Myanmar government that those are th those who are truly illegal immigrants sh should not get a free ride as illegal immigrants. So there's a mix. Uh, it's important to respect the rights, but it's also important to re respect uh, the law. So, um, so. Uh, should I comment on the uh, China? I cannot say, really say much about China, no, it's, but <laughs> but I <laughs> I don't know the situation in China that much. But I think the general point I'd like to support. Uh, the, the general point is, and I think the Myanmar government also feels this strongly. They are receiving a lot of criticism. Other other crises are uh, equally bad or worse, and they're not being criticized as much. Um, but I think this is nothing new. This has happened before. This. Uh, very large CNN effect, as I like to call it, that uh, you you like to think that people running international politics are very smart and very well resourced and do a lot of thinking on their own, but obviously this is very influenced by trending things in media and so on, in, in spite of all this very serious analysis. And I, I, I think it's as simple as that, is, uh, that international attention shifts in a sort of trending way. And that is the reason. There are other crises that are also not given much attention. Congo, and I don't know the Congo that well either. But there are other big crises that uh, deserve more attention than they than they get. Um, so I can just agree with you, I think. Right. Uh, so uh, the question about Singapore. I don't know if any of us have any comment on this. Um, I mean, I would say a bit personally if I were to comment a little bit, or, or I don't know if Christian, you want to. I'll, I'll come after you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would. I was. I would kind of follow very much Knut's lead. I think, which is and which, which was said at the beginning of of the seminar, is it. It's uh, complexity. Uh, there is a high level of complexity. On the one hand, it's clear that the Rohingya are being uh, subject to inhumane uh, treatment, a uh, terrible uh, situation. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's important in, in commenting on that or in trying to influence that to recognize the complexity of the literal, of the situation uh, in uh, a location which is very different from where we are, and that other uh, actors and peoples and countries can have various concerns, which may be along the line of, for example, uh, Singapore. Uh, I mean, of, of, of a fear of then of, of separatism, of uh, new states arising, and so on. Um, yeah. So it's not a very concrete answer, but just to say that, I say there can be many concerns. Uh, if you're going to talk, you have to talk in the microphone, please. Uh, there's one coming. Uh, what, what what I have read is that the Chinese was transferred to Malaysia uh, because uh, the Englishmen, they were not able to get the Malaysian people to work so very well for them. 
Also, there was not so suitable as slaves. And it is about 100 years ago, maybe less. And uh, when uh, Malaysia got the freedom, uh, after some time, uh, Singapore was, um, um, also the Chinese people living in Singapore, they should get the freedom. And now Singapore is, uh, is separated from Malaysia, and it is controlled by the West. It is the whole city, four million people speaking English, and it's an enormous fortress there, controlling the shipping, passing to the Middle East. And that's a neighbor country to Myanmar. And it is very much similarity between this and, 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 the, and the Muslim population in uh, Myanmar. And we have oil and gas and the pipeline from, uh, from, uh, from that area into, it is coming in China. It must be, I, I've not seen a distance, but maybe the length of Norway also. It's very, very long distance. Thank you, thank you. Cost I, uh, some I think million, uh, billion. the, okay, go ahead. Um, a very quick question on that. I think that um, in general, history can, can be useful to understand uh, contemporary complexity. And obviously when you're talking about the, the Rohingya, you can, you can both find historical evidence for uh, migration, but also uh, uh, long-term residence. The history does not necessarily uh, give a clear-cut answer to, to contemporary political challenges. So uh, to, uh, to, to try to address uh, the, the contemporary crisis simply by looking for a straightforward historical answer to what happened, uh, I, I think that history does not give you that. Because for anyone, for when you say this is about colonial, there uh, are other people who can point to other, uh, other stories about the history of, of Rohingya, and I would say that they are equally valid, equally uh, convincing. <coughs> So, so uh, we shouldn't be too. We shouldn't. We should. Uh, we should be historically sensitive, but not take that in a deterministic uh, way when it comes to uh, addressing contemporary political issues. The, the other thing I want to say is that yes, we do need to talk about China, we, or in more general terms, we need to understand the role of international relations, international politics in contemporary processes in Myanmar. That goes for conflict, that goes for democratization, that goes for, for, for development. And uh, 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 it's a long and it's a short uh, story for, uh, for sure. But I also think that when it comes to China, we also have to understand that China is not one monolithic actor with one agenda. Uh, there are uh, there's uh, certainly like the economic interest of China in natural resources and so on and so forth. But, uh, uh, and, but maybe more important in terms of economics, uh, transportation routes, belt and road initiatives and, and, and so on and so forth. But there are also the political things. And I think that maybe that's at least as important. And may, maybe, but then, then you can say, okay, what is China after? What are, what are they trying to do? Uh, are they trying to control Myanmar? Are they trying to uh, rape the natural resources or whatever? I think that the, um, maybe the, the one thing I want to flag the most is that China probably wants a fairly stable, predictable Myanmar. Uh, it, uh, uh, predictable in a way that, uh, that serves uh, Chinese interests. But, uh, but not, a, not necessarily a, a country that is completely under Chinese control or, or that they uh, necessarily manipulate uh, ethnic, ethnic conflicts to, 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 uh, to serve Chinese interests. Uh, and, um, and I think that one thing we need to, to recognize is what some people say that in terms of peace at the moment, China is becoming possibly the most important foreign actor in Myanmar. That's something for, for us in the West to ponder. Thank you. And now we have a new question up front here. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, my name is Maria Heitel. I'm from Care Norway. Um, I think I have two questions. <laughs> um, there's been something that hasn't been mentioned, but uh, that has received a lot of international attention is the rising, what is called rising Buddhist nationalism. 
uh, in relation to the Rakhine crisis. Um, and also that there seems to be a discrepancy between the international uh, perception of how um, how Susan Chi has handled the crisis uh, internationally and versus the national perception. So I, what I'm wondering is, what do you think about the national perception of our Susan Chi in, in light of that? Uh, and then also my second question is, her being a, a woman, what do you see as um, the role of, of women and gender equality in terms of future of peace building and development in Myanmar? Something that hasn't also been mentioned so far. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so the question is, how do we see these things, right? Or yeah, um, I don't think I have fully satisfactory answers to uh, any of them, but I can try to give some pieces of answers to to them. The uh, um, it's but the Buddhist nationalism is uh, is obvious. You were you had on your timeline the Saffron Revolution. But today we see some other types uh, of voices, uh, hate speech, uh, um, agitation, very, very extreme nationalist agitation, also coming from some of the leading monks. Uh, you may have seen a YouTube video recently where you saw the, uh, uh, the head of the military uh, discussing with uh, one of the leading monks. Uh, where they discussed that the uh, Rohingyas should not be allowed to come back, and this leading monk said, well, uh, if need be, we will mobilize the 400,000 monks in the country to stand up against the Rohingyas returning. So the, the, there are these kinds of nationalist sentiments uh, also among monks. There are some, I think, uh, religious Buddhist voices that are more moderate, but they're not as strong as and visible as we can see as this, uh, these more extremist voices. I, I see it as something very dangerous. I see it influencing also beyond the religious community. The Facebook is very, very uh, actively used in Myanmar. And there is a lot of hate speech, a lot of nationalist speech on, uh, on, on Facebook. And, and as you've seen, even in Norway, you see, you have some sort of hate speech can trigger more hate speech. You can spiral and you can you can get people who know absolutely nothing about the subject to have very strong opinions about it because they read somebody else's opinion on Facebook or something like that. And that kind of thing is happening. There's unfortunately uh, this sort of uh, nationalism upsurge as far as I can see it. And I think this is a dangerous path for, for the country. Um, the only way it can be uh, combated, I think, is to to have more understanding and more yeah, a more real understanding. Many of these people who criticize the Rohingyas are people who never spoke to a Rohingya. Uh, and this is, but this is not only this problem is not only there in Myanmar. This is the we we um, there needs to be bridge building. I think I I would. Uh, I think it's important for the religious community to to practice stronger the uh, the dimension of tolerance, which is so strong in Buddhism. Uh, but somehow this seems to be lost from some of this agitation. But <laughs> the uh, uh, I think the national perception of Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, is still very positive. I think she still have a, has a very strong position. I think that uh, maybe some of the ethnic groups in the areas, the ethnic armed groups, the the ethnic groups along the borders to north and east, maybe may feel that they have not gotten all that they wanted after they also voted to get NLD into into the government. But uh, it seems that there is a, a strong position, a strong national popularity of uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi in the country. Um, the role of women in peace building is definitely too small at the moment, but there is some groups working for this. We are trying to contribute to this based on this Security Council Resolution 1325, but um, it's not enough. We need to do more. It's, uh uh, if I can just follow up on the uh, gender situation, and as you said, yeah, the participation of women has been quite limited in the process, but I think the, the UN deserves credit for constantly raising this issue and that it's always discussed at different uh, types of forums um, so that there is like a, I think, 
raising awareness of the need to include more women to have more uh, interests represented. And I think that this uh, underrepresentation of women in the uh, peace process has uh, some roots in the in society in general. And also, if you look at the economic side of it, uh, what we found, for example, is that there's still a huge uh, wage disparity between men and women, like the 30% of uh, disparity. Also, uh, women, um, when it comes to the private sector, they are, um, there's a limited uh, participation of women in the decision-making uh, process when it comes to the like, top management decisions, so like the board of directors' uh, uh, participation and so on. So, I mean, this also has some uh, of the bigger roots uh, in, the, in the entire society and the economy. Um, sorry, I'll, but, um, well, uh, in the report, we are quite short on uh, Buddhism and even shorter on gender. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they are our only uh, excuses for that they are uh, space constraints and also the, uh, we can maybe say something with reference to the, to the mandate that we were given. Uh, I just want to say what, well, what we do say about Buddhism it's basically two things. One, of course, is about the centrality of Buddhism in Myanmar society. That's obvious. This is something that is important uh, for, 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 for the large majority of Burmese. Uh, the second point that we make is that there are complex links between Burmese, no, no, between Buddhism and, and politics. But they're not simple and straightforward. It's not like Buddhism leads to a certain kind of politics. You can find uh, strong examples of uh, Buddhism being used to fight for democracy, for freedom, the Saffron Revolution, Aung San Suu Kyi's book uh, um, Freedom from Fear is very much in that kind of worldview. But you, but you also have equally important examples of uh, Buddhism being justified uh, as uh, being used as a justification for exclusionary identity politics, first and foremost, and aimed at Muslims. So uh, it's not necessarily about Buddhism per se, but it is about uh, understanding the, the political actors, the dynamics, the strategies of using Buddhism, which comes out of exactly the importance of that set of values uh, world view uh, for for uh, for the large majority of Burmese. Right. Uh, it seems we don't have any more questions, um, but I have a couple of last points myself, which I find very interesting. Um, maybe for Knut. Uh, I mean, we have the Rohingya <coughs> issue, which is, is we are, have discussed extensively now, and w which also has a history of boat refugees, which is, has have not been very welcome in, uh, uh, I think, hardly in any of the countries in the region, including the Muslim countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, is do you find that the 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 Myanmar authorities and the various international actors in Myanmar are paying? Uh, or are sufficiently aware of the future risks related to climate change in Bangladesh. Bangladesh being one of the most vulnerable countries in the world, poor, very densely populated, with a very big population, and very low-lying. Um, it doesn't take a lot of sea rise to send a lot of Bangladeshis looking for somewhere to live. Bangladesh has been divorced from India, divorced from Pakistan, um, I don't know how welcome the Bangladeshi climate refugees would be in Myanmar or in other countries in the region. Is, is this a problem that, that actors in Myanmar are uh, thinking about? I think, no. I think in the word, no. I, uh, <laughs> I think the awareness of climate change issues are higher in Bangladesh on, on these issues. I think there is bigger and, and increasing awareness in Bangladesh. Um, I think the idea of this happening, you don't hear much about, in at least those that I have been discussing with in Myanmar. There is uh, some interest in the uh, climate change issue 
but that's for issues inside Myanmar, like uh, the risk for mangroves or the dry area, dry area agriculture, and uh, things and uh, things like this. Uh, but no, I I think they have not seen this uh, issue. But now that you mention it, of course, it's an issue. This this can happen. There is a large number of people, not only in Bangladesh but uh, also in India and other countries in the region, living very very close to the 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 water. So um, yeah, I I don't think we paid enough attention to the risk you were talking about. Do any of you have any final points? No, I, maybe I could or. Would you like to make a... I'm waiting for you to, to, to hear what you're saying. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say maybe, and I'm not sure whether I really have backing for this, but I would say maybe that, uh, uh, well, obviously there are, there are many um, challenges in Myanmar. It's a very uh, dynamic place. Um, and I guess I, I would propose that one thing that we could agree about is that Myanmar is, remains at the crossroads, that Myanmar is a country... Uh, which uh, th there are many poor countries in the world. There are many countries in the world where uh, ethnic conflict is an issue. Um, but that Myanmar sticks out as a country uh, very much at a crossroads. And, and many other countries, perhaps the situation is a bit more of a long term. There isn't so much movement. Whereas for me, it seems that Myanmar has very recently come out of isolation uh, and where it is headed right now could be uh, very many different uh, directions. And therefore, it remains a country which is very important for uh, uh, international actors to be engaged in. Christian. Yes. Um, I agree with that. Uh, but I also uh, want to add that uh, one point that comes out of this report is uh, that it really matters how we engage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, uh, there is a, sometimes in the lines, sometimes between the lines, some critical uh, comments on on the mode of engagement that we especially saw in the period during the USDP government from 2011 to 2016, uh, which kind of centered on um, well. It, the economic side of things, on economic development, on, on uh, investments, and related to that on state capacity building. And no one can deny the importance of economic development or building the state, uh, building a, a functional uh, system of governance in, in Myanmar. Um, this one was this uh, general approach was somewhat problematic in political terms uh, because it was an indirect way of trying to address political issues, but not really being all that aware or politically smart <laughs> of, of the dynamics, and at times, um, uh, at best, doing no harm. At times, uh, deepening uh, deepening uh, problems. So, for instance, a banal example, if you think of something as seemingly non-political as state capacity building, um, is in the context of Myanmar extremely political because it uh, depends on what state capacity you're building. This is a place where state authority is contested and where uh, there's a long history of strong, et especially ethnic organizations, fighting for, uh, struggling for a reorganization of state authority from a unitary, centralized, militarized state to a federal, democratic state with ethnic self-determination. So then, what state capacity are you building? Uh, and that's just an example. I think that uh, the current period is a period where it's become obvious to everyone that it is about politics. Economics is important, but it is also it is very much about politics, and it is important to uh, try to also develop more direct political approaches to democratization, to peace, 
two humanitarian crises. It doesn't have to be an either or, but we have to go beyond what Thomas Carothers calls the almost political revolution in development to take that political seriously, head on. And that's what I'm hinting at when I say transformative democratic politics. Like, uh, and then we could have a long discussion about how to do that and what that means. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't necessarily have the answers. But I think that uh, it is time for including for a country like Norway to think about how do we approach engagement in Myanmar through a political approach to democratization, to peace, and so on and so forth. At not necessarily alone, but certainly with a stronger position in combination with a more developmental approach that we have pursued for now uh, almost 10 years. Thank you. Thanks. I just, not to make another speech, but the, the I, I think Myanmar is a country of great opportunity. It has uh, many challenges long term and now also extremely important short term challenges. Our approach to this needs to be critical engagement, like you're saying. I, I think when we do engagement, is uh, critical engagement, uh, we should do it with a view to what we want to achieve. And I come back to the three pillars of the United Nations, that we should work for peace, for development, and for human rights. And that all these three go together. And you cannot achieve one without the other. And uh, that's something to think about when we engage, because there are voices who say, we should, for, for example, cut development aid to Myanmar to achieve a point on human rights, which I think will work totally against its purpose. It's, uh, we need to work on all fronts at the same time and engage and do it critically. Thank you. Roman, last word. Yeah, well, last word, <coughs> maybe with some more uh, optimism about the country. Um, well, in general, uh, I think it's uh, <coughs> quite advantageous for, for Myanmar that it's surrounded by different neighbors, that it's part of the ASEAN. It's also, there's a big neighbor such as uh, China and India. And I think what for Myanmar, it's important that first, it, well, in a way it can balance like having these different types of neighbors, but also like being in ASEAN, for example, uh, there are many uh, very uh, sort of inspiration stories for the country so that um, it, and I, we also see some evidence that it tried to follow the success stories of some other countries in Southeast Asia. So in a sense, this gives some motivation for the country to move forward. And I think we, uh, as, as long as the country remains open, we can probably hope for some uh, well, positive developments, taking into account all those very complex factors that have been just said. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers, and thank you to the audience. <laughs>